Hi, welcome back to Free Energy Functions in Physical Chemistry. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. All right, so in this video, we're going to talk about one of the very important Gibbs energy um, transformations, and that's called the Gibbs Helmholtz equation. Okay, and this right here is shown in the red box. This is the Gibbs Helmholtz equation. Okay, and basically what it says. And it's very complicated looking, but it will break it down um, slowly but surely, and we'll show you how it's useful. The partial derivative of free energy change over temperature with respect to temperature at constant pressure is equal to negative delta H over T squared. Okay, so this is in itself what we call a separate, separable ordinary differential equation. But the Gibbs-Helmholtz equation is a separable differential equation. What that essentially means is I'm going to look at the variables of the differentials. So in that case, it's temperature. In this case, it's delta G over T. What a separable equation is, is essentially means whatever I circled there, I can get all the temperatures on one side, and I can get all the delta G over T's on the other side. Okay. And I actually can do that in this case. Okay, so here I have the differential equation. And what I'm going to do is I'm not really concerned about this constant pressure right here. Okay, I'm not concerned about that. I'm going to assume in the experiment the pressure is constant. And that's actually one of the things that's pretty easy to do because most things are open to the atmosphere. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply both sides by dt. Okay, in that case, notice dt cancels here, and then I multiply it on this side. Now notice what I've done at that point. Notice I have all the delta G over T's on the left side, and I have all the explicit T's on the right side. Okay, That's a sign that you have a separable equation. And separable equations are arguably probably the easiest differential equations to deal with, because once you have the variables separated, you can actually just integrate both sides. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to integrate um, the le left side. And I could say from T1 to T2. However, what I'm going to do, because delta G is also a function, I'm going to throw in here also that I'm going to do it from delta G1 T1 to delta G2 T2. All right, because you actually, you probably haven't seen this in calculus yet, but you, you can actually throw any combination of variables inside the differential element. Because normally you just say like dt, dx, dz, so stuff like that. But you can have a d delta g over t inside there. But since delta g and t are both variables, I have to integrate from delta g1 t1 to delta g2 t2. Okay? On this side... The only thing that's inside the differential is T, so I only have to integrate from T1 to T2. All right, so when I do that, I'm integrating a differential. That's just the function itself. Delta G over T from T1 to T2, and technically it's delta G1, T1 to delta G2, T2. On this side, it's going to be delta H over T from T1 to T2. Because notice when I integrate something over t squared, I get negative 1 over t. And that's why the negative sign right here disappeared. You don't see it here. So now I'm actually going to evaluate this. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say that when I evaluate this, it's going to be delta g at temperature 2 over t2 minus delta g at t1 over temperature 1 is equal to delta h times... 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1, all right? Now, one key thing to understand here is that the enthalpy delta H that you use here is at temperature 1. Notice this is at temperature 1. The goal of this um, Gibbs-Helmholtz equation, the reason it's important, is let's suppose that you were able to calculate the delta G at a given temperature. Okay, so one, one good example of this is... If you were to calculate the delta G, um, say, at equilibrium, right? You calculate the delta G at equilibrium. Um, and usually when you do that, you can actually look in a table. And the table is usually in the back of your physical chem textbook. And it's set to 298 Kelvin. 
So if you look in those tables, the temperature initial, which is what we're going to call it, temperature 1, is 298 Kelvin. Okay? So if I want to calculate the delta G standard at 298, let me actually just delta G standard at 298 Kelvin, but let's say I wanted the delta G standard at 300 and, let's say 309 Kelvin, right? Delta G standard at 309 Kelvin. Well, I can't just, I can't look this up in a table. I mean, tables would be infinite length if they were at all temperatures, right? So it's not worth it to do that. You can simply calculate delta G at 298 Kelvin by looking things up in the table, okay? In some cases, you may have to use delta H standard and delta S standard to do that, but you can calculate this. We'll go over how to do that in another video. But if I want to find this at 309 Kelvin, well, temperature 2 is 309 Kelvin, right? I can calculate delta H standard, at, three, at 298 Kelvin, right? That's temperature one. I can calculate that. I can just look that up in the back of the table. So that means if I am able to calculate enthalpy at 298 Kelvin using the standard tables in the back, I know delta H at 298. I know temperature two, that's whatever the problem specifies, maybe 309 Kelvin. I know temperature one, 298 Kelvin. I know temperature one, I know temperature two. I know delta G at T1 because I can calculate that either directly if they have those or I can use delta H and delta S and what I would use is delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. I can do that, right, and calculate this delta G at T1. So that can be known and that leaves the only variable I don't know, which is consequently what I want, as delta G at temperature 2. So again, why is the Gibbs-Helmholtz solution important? It's because if I need to calculate the delta G at equilibrium and it's not at the temperature that I can find easily in the back of the book, which is 298 Kelvin, I can simply use this formula, calculate delta H at temperature 1 and delta G at temperature 1, rearrange this to solve for delta G at temperature 2, and I have that. And sometimes that is important. Another way this would be important, say, is... If you had a reaction, okay, let's say you had a reaction um, that you're doing in like mass production, okay? Let's say you knew the delta G at the temperature you were doing the reaction at. Let's say you're doing it at room temperature, say, okay? And let's suppose you wanted to say, ask yourself, what would happen to the rate, or what would happen to the, not the rate, but the, the, the spontaneity of the reaction if I were to say increase the temperature to 400 Kelvin? Well, in that case, if you know the delta G at room temperature, if you know that, and there are ways to calculate it even if you don't, but if you know that, you know the initial temperature, that's, you know, room temperature. If you want to calculate it at 400 Kelvin, well, you know temperature too, and then you can go ahead and calculate this. Now, if you're doing this production at room temperature, you're likely not at equilibrium, right? So you're also calculating a delta G at T2 that's also not at equilibrium. So the Gibbs-Helmholtz equation is actually useful in both those aspects. It can be useful for calculating delta G at equilibrium, and it can be useful for calculating them when they're not at equilibrium. That's why this, this solution to the Gibbs-Helmholtz equation is so important. In another video, we'll look at how to deal with this when you actually have real numbers. That'll probably be the next video. And after that, we'll look at another transformation to the, uh, of the free energy functions. So hope this video helped you get a handle on the solution Gibbs-Helmholtz equation. We'll look at um, an example with numbers in the next video. See you soon.